All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Projectile motion, here we go. First of all, what is a projectile? It can be anything, any object. And so uh, it's gotta be set into motion. Now the motion is typically gonna be uh, in two dimensions where it follows a, you know, a path through, through space or through air that uh, you can think of as being in an X and a Y direction simultaneously. And uh, so how does it get this motion? Well, I mean, you could throw it, you could kick it, you could drop it, you could um, almost anything, um, roll it off the edge of a cliff or off of a countertop, uh, just about any means of creating the motion is fine. But there's some interesting stuff that you want to uh, understand about this. First of all, um, there's motion in two dimensions happening simultaneously. And the motion in the x and the y directions are independent of each other. That's a real important idea. The independence of x and y motions. So we're really talking about the x and y components of the motion. Now that also means that uh, the equations of kinematics can apply uh, to the x and y direction separately. And so it's almost like you would uh, deal with the horizontal information using the appropriate equation or equations. And you would deal with the vertical information using the appropriate equations there. You guys remember the big five kinematics equations, these guys. So you have uh, stuff about uh, relating velocities, uh, initial and final velocities to acceleration of time. Average velocity, that's an easy one. Uh, initial and final position with average velocity and time. You have initial and final position if you have your initial velocity, the rate of acceleration and the time or you can relate the initial and final velocities to the rate of acceleration and the change in position. And you would use this last one if you don't know any information about the time. So that's what we're getting at. So uh, you would use these equations in both the x and y directions. Sort of like separate problems, sort of. Now, um, I have this image right here of what might be the path of a projectile. Um, but it doesn't have to look like that. You could have something, if it's, say, rolling off of a tabletop, then it's going to just do one of these things. If you have something you throw straight up in the air, it's going to do one of these and come right back down, right? Um, it is possible to have some launch height here and some launch angle but the landing is not at the same elevation as the launch. Those are interesting. They're a little more complicated than I think what we're going to get into. But also, all those things are uh, definite possibilities and they all represent projectile motion. Okay, so let's nail down some I don't know if you want to call it definitions um, these, or properties of all projectile motion. So um, th this may be in no particular order, but the path, that two-dimensional path is called a trajectory. That's just the path through the air or through space. And the trajectory is parabolic. And it might not be an entire parabola. You can see a little bit of a parabola missing here. You can see half of a parabola missing here. But it's still parabolic in nature. Uh, there's a lot of symmetry to the flight and, and, and to, to other things as well. Symmetry, I, let me finish that word. So um, what do I mean by this? Well, if you have a projectile and it is sent 
up and comes back down. Then what we have is uh, some knowledge about the speed. And so you have a launch speed here, or launch velocity here. And there's an, a landing velocity here. Now I knew I drew it kind of into the ground. That's not the point. The point is right there is where the velocity is happening, and right there is where that velocity is happening. And as long as those two points are at the same elevation or same height, then those two velocities will be the same. That's one of the symmetries that we see. So the left and right half of the parabola are sort of like mirror images of each other. And this speed is, it, it depends on uh, the height. So it, you know, if we throw it up and it's kind of doing one of these things like a football thrown through the air, well, how about at that point? That point, the speed would be the same as it is at that point. So we have symmetry around the highest point or around the midpoint. Um, and it truly is the midpoint as well. If, if it's thrown and caught at the same elevation, then these distances of the first half and the second half literally are equal. And it doesn't matter that it's go heading upward here or heading downward there. That's not the important point. Uh, another important property of projectile motion. And this is that uh, gravity is really the only thing affecting it. Gravity is the only acceleration happening to a projectile. This implies something real important. It implies that uh, we are ignoring air resistance. We're not going to take that into account. And there are certain situations where that, uh, that's you know, reasonable to do. But this gravitational acceleration that the object will be experiencing, it's going to experience that acceleration throughout the entire flight. And uh, that gravitational acceleration, we use lowercase g for that. It's really, or truly, an acceleration, but it's in the y direction. Gravity only pulls straight down. That's the y direction. So there is this value where the acceleration of the y direction is equal to g, and we're typically going to use 9.8 meters per second squared. Your textbook may, in fact, I think it does, use 9.81. You'll see that. Well, the difference between 9.8 and 9.81 is uh, pretty small. And in fact, on the AP exam, I believe they allow you to use 10 for the acceleration due to gravity, 10 meters per second squared as a, a, a rough estimate, a, r a number that's easy to work with to let you get your answer in the, in the ballpark of what you need. So if gravity, though, is the only thing affecting it, that must mean there is no acceleration horizontally. Uh, another way to say that is the velocity in the x direction is constant. That is a real important point here. And so we have acceleration in the x direction of zero. There is no acceleration in the x direction. OK, now, um, well, what about this? If we break this, break this up into horizontal and vertical components, and we're dealing with them separately, then the vertical component of this motion really is going to be identical to a free fall situation. And that could mean that it was simply dropped and allowed to fall. That could mean that it was thrown straight up and maybe caught or maybe allowed to fall back down. Uh, that, that technically is also free fall, even if it's tra traveling upward. Um, there's more here. This is, uh, this is critical now. We're, we're, let's talk about time. Time in the air. Time, first of all, of flight. I'll just say time of flight. Or time in the air, same thing. It's determined solely by y values. 
by the information in the y direction. That information are, uh, could be things like height, could be things like uh, velocity in the y direction, etc. Maybe. And there's definitely acceleration in the y direction as well. So the time of flight is determined by y values, information in the y direction, not by information in the x direction. And so if you think about that, well, then that means that the, since the, say, the, the height that it falls from determines how long it spends in the air, well, that might allow it to travel a further distance horizontally. So the time of flight will affect horizontal range of the projectile, but the, the horizontal motion or velocity or, or range distance uh, traveled is, is not going to change the amount of time taken. Uh, one more thing about time here, it's, it's the, what they have in common, the x and the y um, the motions in the x and y directions, the com x and y components of the motion. Uh, time is the link between x and y components of motion. And so the time it takes to travel horizontally a certain distance is the same time it's going to take to reach the ground again and stop moving. And that's going to be pretty useful to you at, uh, at times. OK, so now what? Um, let's look at something specific here. So I'm going to use this information. I'm going to be talking about this, or at least some of it, when we look at this stuff. All right. What's going on here? We can see that uh, we're going to have a projectile launched at a particular launch angle. And so I'm not going to connect these dots. That's not what I'm getting at here. This is actually going to be a velocity vector. And I don't quite know how long to draw that arrow, and that's OK. But uh, this represents the initial launch velocity. And so we see VO, uh, we're having, uh, in this example, 10 meters per second of this launch velocity, and the angle is 40 degrees. So I know that doesn't quite look like a 40 degree launch angle. That's all right. Bear with me here. What I've done is I've broken up that initial velocity into an initial component in the x direction, this guy, and an initial component in the y direction, that's this guy. And I did that by simply using some uh, right triangle geometry. I've got VO times the cosine of the launch angle, and I've got here VO times the sine of the launch angle. Now, uh, so, so you know where these two numbers here come from. And I have the acceleration due to gravity as a positive 9.81 meters per second per second. Same thing as meters per second squared just so you know, so you're comfy with this. OK, same thing. How come it's not negative? Well, because, uh, you know, I mean, gravity pulls down. And typically, if you're looking at x and y coordinates, then downward would be in the negative y direction. And yes, I understand that. But the traditional way of dealing with this is that g has a positive value of 9.8 meters per second squared, or 9.81. And what we're going to do is we're going to put the minus sign into the equation. We're going to build it in like that. So let's look at what's going on. I'm going to track this projectile launch at 10 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees. I'm tracking it at various times, a tenth of a second. And I want to see what happens. So my horizontal position, OK, um, where is this thing horizontally? that's uh, determined by this relationship. I have an, um, a horizontal launch velocity, which is here. And I have an amount of time that I'm watching. Now, these, these, uh, this is kind of simple because there's no acceleration horizontally. Gravity is only affecting things vertically. So this is a constant velocity across the whole entire situation. So I could see how far it's gone. And what I think you will notice, and it kind of is important, so I can do 
some quick lines here, you'll see the idea, you'll see the point, right? Look at these lines. And they're, they're more or less very equidistant from each other. They're equally spaced. And that's what you would expect, that every tenth of a second we're increasing the distance by an equal interval. From there to there, there to there, there to there, 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 equal intervals. Cool. Well, what about the vertical position? Well, this, th this equation comes from the big five, right? You can see it's more or less this guy right here, where the initial position is zero in this case. And so we have the y values, and we have determined by initial velocity in the y direction, multiplied by time. And then we have, oh, there's a minus sign. So there it is. So for acceleration, I'm plugging in positive g, which is 9.1, and there's my half. The 0.5 is the half. And then I'm going to plug the time squared in right there. But the acceleration is in the negative direction, so I have to switch from a plus, uh, plus sign to a minus sign in the equation. And that is typically how this is handled. So every tenth of a second, I have a vertical position. And so vertical positions, you can see, are increasing, increasing, increasing for a time, for a time. And I want to illustrate something here with you. When this gets graphed, you can see, well, we're comparing to this line here. So I'll do this carefully for you. Oh, just about on that line, right? So look at this. You can see that this distance seems to be shrinking, shrinking, shrinking as it goes up. And it's going to reach a point where it's at the highest point. And afterward, as time goes on, it's continuing to, f to sail, continuing to fly through the air. But notice those vertical distances are going to get larger and larger and larger back down until the ground. Now, I don't have an actual um, ground that stops this thing. This is the zero elevation right here, right? And so this data point here is you know, just kind of a continuation of what's going on. And so if this were the ground level where the y position is zero, it probably would hit right about there. Did you get the idea? The velocity horizontally is constant velocity. The velocity vertically is accelerated motion. And so with this upward component of velocity, there is always the downward component of acceleration, well, really a g, yeah? And so that's going to slow it down. So slowing, 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 slowing. But then on the way down, it's going to be speeding it up. So you see increasing, increasing, increasing distance travel. OK, wanted to share that with you. And um, there's more work coming later. But for now, this is a pretty good introduction to projectile motion. What's the most important little bit of information? It isn't the equations, because those are pretty easy to deal with. It's, it's these ideas, I think. These properties of projectile motion that you really, really want to, to first learn them, memorize them. But second, as we work through this stuff, keep in mind uh, where each one of these is showing up and what that looks like. Okay, That's it for now. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.